Good day, everyone, and welcome to this LIDAR News educational webinar on examining 3D accuracy in building documentation, co-sponsored by Paracosm and the U.S. Institute of Building Documentation, the USIBD. My name is Gene Rowe. I'm the founder of LIDAR News. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to attend today's webinar. As I'm sure you are aware, we're taking on a challenging topic. Unfortunately, we do not have all the answers, but I think we have some important information and best practices that you will be able to immediately take advantage of. At the very least, we're going to raise your level of awareness for specifying 3D accuracy. Before we start the presentations, I'd like to make sure you are properly connected. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface panel that you should be seeing in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Slide it out if it is docked. You have two audio options to choose from, computer audio or by calling in via phone. To switch between the two, just click on the circle next to your preferred audio option. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session. In addition, we have a few more items that we are calling in case you are wondering. I'll give you a few moments to read through these. Let us know if you have any questions via the question box and we'll do our best to help. If all else fails, please use your invitation to reconnect or perhaps use a different browser. We will be providing a full recording. I'd like to briefly introduce you to today's speakers. Kevin Kianka is the Director of Operations for Hague Technical Services, where he leads a group of professionals that provide clients with 3D documentation and modeling. Mr. Kianka is a USA IBD board member in addition to serving as chair of the USIBD Education Committee, and he has assisted in developing the LOA document he's going to be talking about today. Amir Rubin is the founder and president of Paracosm. He's leading the development of the computer vision and SLAM technology that make up the next generation of 3D scanning tools, bringing everyone a step closer to his dream of 3Difying the world. I'm the founder of LiDAR News and MPN Components. I'm celebrating 50 years as a consulting civil engineer in the surveying and mapping field. Currently the chair of the ASTM E57.04 committee that developed the widely adopted 3D data interoperability standard. Today's agenda will include two short polls. I'll start the presentations by taking a brief look back at how we have transitioned from 2,000 plus years of the rifle approach to surveying, where the party chief knew the intent and how to get close enough, to the shotgun approach used by laser scanners, where there are many more factors that go into determining and specifying the 3D positional uncertainty of a point cloud. Kevin Kianka is going to introduce you to the USIBD level of accuracy specification and how to properly apply it along with the level of development to 3D building documentation projects. And Amir Rubin is going to give you his perspective on building his company, Paracosm, based on the design and development of the unique PX80 handheld mobile scanner. We will wrap things up with key takeaways, and then we should have 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Let's begin with poll question number one. This should give everyone an idea of the experience level of the audience with respect to handheld laser scanning. So we'll be leaving this question up for about 30 seconds and then we will close the poll and show the results.
Okay, Sean? Yep, all set to go. All right, let's move on. As I celebrate 50 years as a civil engineer in the surveying and mapping profession, it's incredible to look back to the days of log tables, steel tapes, and plumb bobs, and compare that to where we are today with GPS, the internet, and LIDAR, which will soon be on every vehicle. The younger geospatial professionals in the audience have no idea what those first couple thousand years of surveying were like. Before scanning, it was one point at a time. The party chief decided what those points were. More importantly, what methods to use to ensure the required positional accuracy was achieved. The party chief knew what the intent of the survey was and what it meant to be close enough. As transformational as scanners are, they are the classic black box. And what's worse, they are dumb. To make up for the inability to point the scanner, they use a shotgun approach to cover the scene. This has many pluses and minuses. Unfortunately, we do not have standards for the instruments or their use. The current national surveying standards are essentially 2D and in need of a major update to 3D. On the software side, there are also major issues. The leading CAD, BIM, and GIS packages evolved from 2D databases from the 80s that assumed that the real world was perfectly orthogonal, planar, and plumb. ASTM E57 and the USIBD are steps in the right direction, but much more work needs to be done. As you will see, these are complicated problems that the industry is not addressing. More on that in a couple of slides. The use of light to measure distance goes back 100 years. The purpose in the beginning was to measure aerosol particles in the atmosphere. With the invention of the ruby laser in the 1960s, the flashlights that were being used were replaced with tightly collimated laser beams. The first commercial sensors were developed for airborne LIDAR mapping. Costs were high, as was the training and the platforms, which continues to today. Determining the accuracy of the remote sensing was an extension of the methods used in photogrammetry. Due to the inherent limitations of the LIDAR systems, checking the accuracy of the data could be accomplished using ground control surveys that were clearly better than what the LIDAR sensors could deliver. The early tripod scanners left room for control surveys to provide a higher level of accuracy as a check against the truth. But as you can see, when we fast forward to today, with the exception of airborne LIDAR, many laser scanning and UAS camera systems are claiming accuracies in the millimeter range. This makes it very difficult to compare the accuracy of the data against an established higher order control survey. This table is somewhat easier to read. In the case of airborne, good news is the ASPRS and USGS are providing mapping standards that are specifically for LIDAR sensors. ASTM has developed a range standard for tripod scanners and the Transportation Research Board funded a project that developed a set of guidelines for the use of mobile LIDAR systems. These are all important developments, but much more needs to be done. We'll come back to the principle of higher order control surveys on the next slide. But first, let's take a quick look at errors in general, or more appropriately, positional uncertainty. I like the latter term because it brings up the notion of probability and statistics. This is what we need to keep in mind when we are specifying the accuracy of any survey. There are no error-free measurements. Error statements need to have a sound statistical basis. Assuming we eliminate blunders, and minimize systematic errors, which in the case of a LIDAR sensor is not that simple to verify, then accuracy equals precision plus bias, where the tighter the precision of the measurements, the better the accuracy. Precision is measured by making independent measurements of the points. The goal is to specify the positional uncertainty or level of accuracy of the points, which is a difficult problem to solve particularly in 3D, where the errors are spherical. 
There are many unknowns and no standard methods of determining the errors. One approach is to average the linear errors in X, Y, and Z. This approach assumes the errors are Gaussian, which only applies to a single scan. A recent research paper by Matt O'Banion et al. that looked at this topic reported that the uncertainty was not uniform across the point cloud. This only adds to the complexity. So how should you determine the accuracy of a laser scanning survey? You must do a second survey to check the accuracy of your work against what you consider to be the truth. In principle, the control survey should be at least twice as accurate as the data collection. Some say an order of magnitude. The accuracy of a control survey is estimated mainly through redundant and statistically independent measurements in a least squares adjustment of some type. Assuming your control can be trusted, the errors can be determined by independent measurements from the control to the checkpoints. The root mean square error can be calculated and reported as an indication of the accuracy. It is straightforward to convert from RMSE to 95% confidence interval. When this can't be accomplished, it is important to realize that you are placing your reputation at risk and that you should look for alternatives. So as you can see, the issue of specifying accuracy or positional uncertainty is a complicated one. The first two bullets here, along with the earlier reference, are valuable documents for you to take a look at. In general, for a laser scan, checkpoints should be observed multiple times at different times and from different instrument setups. The precision or repeatability of the measurements would be an indication of accuracy, assuming no bias but the checkpoints should also be surveyed independently, say with a total station, to serve as constraints, preferably weighted by their uncertainties, or at least as checks to ensure there is no bias. One of the early pioneers in the 3D laser scanning field used to check the calibration of his scanners in a room that had targets, which were located permanently using and measured using a laser tracker. Quick thanks to Michael Dennis, Michael Olson for their insights on these best practices. When we began working on the ASTM E57 data interoperability standard 15 plus years ago, vendors were not willing to share their proprietary data formats. Once they realized that E57 was going to change that, they decided that they would open them up to customers. A significant investment of time went into delivering that standard, there is no easy button. In many industries, people have realized that by supporting standards, they increase their productivity and lower their costs of doing business. By serving on a committee, they get advance notice of the coming standard and they get to influence that standard. As you will see next, the USIBD members have been making major investments of their time in order to improve the building documentation industry. They deserve tremendous credit for this ongoing work. Now I'd like to turn the screen over to Kevin Kianka. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Kianka, and as Gene said, I'm a board member of the USIBD. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the USIBD is and then go into the LOA specification. Uh, the USIBD is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we consider ourselves a leading resource in the building documentation industry <clears throat> with a goal of promoting, guiding, and educating all stakeholders. We're not just interested in the, the service provider, the architect, the engineer, the building owner, we're interested in everybody, bringing everybody up to the same level. And we actually published the first building documentation specifications um, that are specific to building documentation. So we have a request for qualifications, a request for proposals, 3D imaging spec. Uh, we just released a 2D imagery RFQ and 2D imagery specification um, last month. 
and the LOA specification, which we're going to talk about. And more information can be found on this at usibd.org. And we're also always looking for new members and people in the industry to help us out. So why is the LOA needed? Um, if you're familiar with building modeling, uh, there's the LOD spec from BIMform, which identifies the level of development of models. What we saw was missing was, and this was discussed throughout our industry, was the level of accuracy. How accurate are these building measurements? How accurate do they need to be by a client, and how accurate are they by the professional that's doing it? Uh, there was no applicable standard to identify these throughout the industry. And then also, how are real-world conditions represented? Should an out-of-plumb wall be depicted as out-of-plumb, or should it be predicted as plumb and perpendicular? As Gene mentioned earlier in the presentation, most CAD software developed anticipates a perfectly you know, orthogonal world. Everything is parallel, perpendicular, and plumb but the real world isn't that way. So how do you represent that? And this came through some issues with contracts that members of the USIBD and other members had where they thought they were gonna represent as parallel and plumb and perpendicular and the client wanted it as a real world condition. So the LOA was also needed to provide a consistent form of communication. Again, how do we get all stakeholders on the same page so that the person requesting it understands what they're requesting it, the, per, the design professional or documentation professional understands what they're doing, and everybody's on the same page. So what we came up with was the USIBD level of accuracy document. So this is actually three different documents. So we've got B120, which is a guide, B220, which is a template, and B320, which is a sample document. So this is to assist the individuals and organizations wishing to specify levels of accuracy in building documentation. And we have different range there. And we had stakeholders create this. We, we start out with version one, version two, and we are going to be releasing version three next month. So this is the third version. We're making updates. And this was created by a variety of stakeholders throughout the industry. We had architects, engineers, designers, specifiers, scanning companies, um, people that measured with distos, surveyors. It was everybody we could get our hands on to do this. Another key aspect of it, it is no charge. It's on the USIBD website for free. So the question, Gene brought this up, when is close enough, close enough? That's the biggest question here. What do you need to do as a person providing a building documentation, uh, as providing building documentation, what do you want to specify? So got a great picture here. When is close enough, close enough? Is that tattoo exactly what the client wanted? Probably not. So we're getting to the point now, when is close enough, close enough. We go to another uh, scan set, and there are some issues with the registration here. You've got floor elevations that vary by just over half a foot, is that, or, or just over an inch. Is that close enough? It may be, it may not be, but how do you determine that with a contract? How do you determine that if there's never a discussion? So what the USIB did was we started looking at, well, is it just the measured or is it the represented? So we're going to talk about this further, but just to give you a guideline, here's a wall, and this was provided by a USIBD member. It's a retaining wall on a site, and they, they provide a laser scan of it. And there was an original area of concern, sections A, B, and there's also C and D here, but A and B were the primary of concern. It's a modular block retaining wall. So the wall was scanned uh, with a laser scanner, and you could see here sections A and B the wall's battered. It's actually leaning out in A and it's bulging in B and they're varying distances. So that's the real world condition. That's the, the accuracy of what's actually out there. The question is, how do you want that represented? Do you have to draw each block? Do you want the wall shown as battered or do you want it shown as perfectly plumb? Um, we go to section C and it's bulging and then actually crossing back against the plane. And we have section D that's pretty close to the design intent. So the real world is not perfect. So how do we take this, this jumbled mess of everything we have in the real world and get it into a contract for building documentation? So one of the things we want to talk about is everybody talks about accuracy, but do you really know what you're talking about? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a civil engineer by training, and we talk about did you consider temperature? thermal expansion of structural steel. 
If you have a temperature range of 32 to 100 degrees a day on a 50 foot long steel beam bridge, you could have a quarter of an inch change in length due to thermal expansion or contraction. So did you take that into account? We've seen specifications with a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch, a 32nd of an inch. Do you really know what you're talking about and is it really achievable? And the next one is what I like to show up. People start throwing out 16th of an inch, 32nd of an inch. Here's what we're really talking about. And I love this graphic. You know, a 32nd of an inch is a pencil tip. 16th of an inch is the tip of a crown and 3 16 of an inch is an eraser. That's the level of accuracy people are talking about. I like to show visualizations here because people throw around numbers all the time, but I don't know if they really understand what it is. And for our people with metric, again, we've got one millimeter, two millimeter, and five millimeters. So the US IBD went around and we looked at relevant standards that were out there. At this point, before the LOA, we'd already had the RFQ and the RFP, and there's actually a, a DIN 18710, which is a, a engineering survey specification from Germany. Uh, BIMFORM had their level of development specifications, and we started looking at BOMA, RIC specification, GSA, and ASCE. Uh, at the end of the day, we started, we honed down to two that kind of encompassed a lot of what, where we thought we needed to go, and it was the DIN 18710 standard, which is an engineering survey standard from Germany. There's five levels of accuracy, standard deviation, upper ranges, lower ranges, and it could be applied to building documentation. We then looked at the USI, or AGC BIMFORM's LOD specification, and again, different LOD. So how can we take all this great tech, great specifications already out there and kind of get something to talk about accuracy? Um, another thing we looked at was Uniformat. Uh, it's a standard for classifying building specifications, cost estimates, and cost analysis in the US and Canada, and it utilized major building components. So we started looking at resources that were already out there. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if you're not familiar with Uniformat, there's different categories, level one, level two. So level one, as you'll see on the left, we've got the different aspects of a building, substructure, shell, interiors, services. Level two and three, we can hone down more. So level two, A10 is foundations. Level three, A1010 is standard foundations, A1020 is special foundations. So we started looking at these resources already out there that would help us specify this better. Again, get all the stakeholders of the industry talking on the same page. So unif why is uniform at important? We didn't reinvent the wheel, we utilize a national standard and it's an ASTM standard. So if you want more information on it, csinet.org, but that's kind of the basis of our LOA. So we talked about that, so now let's get into fundamentals of the LOA. The end of the day, the main form for the LOA is document C220, and that's pretty much the spreadsheet. What we've done is we've done exactly what we talked about before. We've got a measured accuracy and a represented accuracy. We've got uniformat, and we've got different fields you can fill in. The nice part about the LOA, you can make it as complex or as simple as you want. And what we did in the next slide you'll see, we had six defined levels of accuracy. So much like the LOD has LOD 100, LOD 200, 300, 350, we have six levels of accuracy. We've got UD, which is a user defined level, LOA 10, LOA 20, 30, 40, and 50. We have both metric ranges and we have English, uh, imperial ranges here. So for whether you're using metric or imperial, we've got the ranges here. And for those who are using imperial, we're talking about, you know, LOA 10 is between two to six inches. LOA 20 is five eighths of an inch to two inches accuracy. 30 is a quarter of an inch to five eighths. 40 is a 16th a quarter. And 50 is better than a 16th of an inch accuracy. So we've got upper ranges and lower ranges. What we're doing is trying to get everybody on the same page. And from that standpoint, we also have measured versus represented, what we talked about before. Not only is it the measured accuracy, but how is it going to be represented? And there are two there for a reason, because we can have a measured accuracy of a quarter of an inch, but I don't want to see that wall out of plumb. So if it's within two inches, I'm good. So we can have a LOA 30 for a measured accuracy, but an LOA 20 for represented accuracy, because my client doesn't want to pay for a model that's down to a quarter of an inch. They're, they're good with two inch accuracy. So that's why you have to measure represented. So again, you can have different areas. And what are we talking about? 
measured and represented. Again, point cloud bouncing all over the surface, hitting a surface, hitting a non-smooth surface, where's that? And then we've got, where's the true surface? And then where are you representing it at? And this kind of summarizes the different levels of accuracy out there and what we can do. So a big thing we did, we took, we hopefully took a lot of the guesswork out of it for people who are new or, or stakeholders who may not be as familiar with it. But what we did was we defined suggested and accepted levels of accuracy. So we've got shading in the spreadsheet where yellow is the suggested most commonly used. And this is not one person coming up with it. This is dozens of individuals sitting there saying, what would I want in this area? So as you go through it, it varies the suggested, accepted, and special levels of accuracy. So a person unfamiliar with it can kind of get some guidance from the industry. And you'll see here it varies based upon the, the components. Um, we've got a level of accuracy of 20 for the foundations, but if you're looking at a special foundation, we talk of suggested is LOA 30. So it varies depending upon the actual component you're looking at measuring and then depicting. So another thing we have is we have two fields of application. So our, our, our first release, the LOA, was just one, just one uh, application. And we had a lot of requests from a heritage side. So uh, historic buildings, heritage buildings. So there is a, a toggle button for standard and heritage. So if you're doing a heritage site, um, you can actually specify different requirements. We have different suggestions for heritage sites for documentation. And this was, we had a whole group from the heritage industry that helped us come up with the requirements for, or the suggestions for the heritage side of it. So we've got two different ones there and you can see they vary. I'll flip back and forth real quick. You can see the suggested, accepted and special vary for each. And this was again, us reaching out to the industry. So. There's obviously an impact on cost with a different level of accuracy. Specifying of level of accuracy could modify a cost. That's what we say, it's gonna modify the cost. Different accuracies require different components, different things done. Higher LOAs require, uh, or, or tighter LOAs require additional expenses. Getting down to a 16th of an inch, it may be a different instrument, maybe something else. Uh, additionally, the process is required to maintain that will modify the fee, so and potentially the schedule. So we put this out there as a discussion point, so everybody's on the same page. Uh, the one thing we don't talk about is means or methods. From a US IBD standpoint, we don't care, and the LOA document doesn't care the means or methods of acquiring it. You could use any tool. You could steel tape, total station, laser scanner, photogrammetry. You could pace it off. You could take a guess, you could use a disto. It doesn't matter, we just want the accuracy there. So we're agnostic to the means, methods, and equipment used. As long as you can maintain this accuracy, that's it. So we've become agnostic to that. And again, we don't talk about survey control, what you need to do. That's a discussion later on in a proposal and a document. Uh, our one suggestion is review the proposal. Again, this brings up talking points. It's really to, to get all the stakeholders in a proposal, in a building documentation project, talking and discussing the same language so they're all on the same page. And again, a lot of this should be implementing the contract documents, but at the end of the day, it's on the service provider to determine the means and methods. Uh, that's our suggestion figure out the means and methods. This is the accuracy the client wants. The service provider who's best fitted for that, in our mind, should be the one deciding the means and methods. <clears throat> so back to measured, uh, measured accuracy and represented accuracy. Again, measured is the actual field data. This is handheld measurements, GPS points, total stations, point clouds, and it should be used wherever the LOA spe is specified. The represented accuracy is how you depict the field data. This is plans, models, sections, elevations. This should only be utilized and specified when there's a deliverable other than just the field data. So again, measure versus represent, how different can they be? How would you depict this wall? How would you, how does the client want to depict this wall? And more importantly, how's the modeler going to do it? And does their fee fit in with the cost of the project? So that's measured versus represented. So now we're on to the real quick part. How do you actually apply the LOA? So items to specify the spreadsheet and text specification. So we'll go over all this real quick. So the specifier, we talk about a primary control network. If there is one, again, this could be in the contract somewhere else. 
And are we looking at global or local accuracy? We can define both at the same time, and we talk about that in our LOA documents. And then the goal is for the specifier to utilize the uniform format, choose the specific building elements required for the LOA, and choose the appropriate LOA required. So at the end of the day, we've got our spreadsheet, the document C20, C220, and this can actually be submitted as an attachment to the contract, where you can just go into the spreadsheet and what we recommend is in the spreadsheet putting x's where you want them foundations put an x at loa 20 put an x here you could this way all the stakeholders can see if it's above if it's the suggested accepted or if it's special um, but we recommend that use the spreadsheet it's there it's free that's what it's there for there's also a text specification uh, where we have the measured accuracy validation represented accuracy and validation i'll talk about validation in a minute um, but this can be a text specification. We talk about this more in our document. And uh, John Roos and I actually run a course at the USIBD Symposium where we go into almost a two-hour presentation on the LOA. But this can be used as a text specification if someone doesn't want to use a spreadsheet. So we talk about validation here, but what are we actually talking about? So we didn't want to get into means and methods, but a lot of the stakeholders advise us they want us to talk about how to validate that the data is correct. So we've got three different levels of measurement validation. We've got no data check, overlapping data checks is B, and C is independent measurements and methods. So we, we kind of give a brief overview of this, but this way there's talking points out there. From a representation standpoint, it's a little more troublesome. We have A is no check, B is a single check, and C is a double check we didn't want to get into deliverables and what was required so this is kind of an open discussion again it calls a discussion between the stakeholders of job to figure out what they're going to do so we didn't go into this in depth just to leave it open so there can be a discussion because software changes there's new software coming out that will check things we didn't want to be locked into something so where are we at right now uh the loa version 2 is currently out there uh, there's an LOA version three, it's in final review. It's pending our legal committee and board review. But once that's done, all of our LOA documents actually go through a final ratification approval from our USIBD membership. Our goal is for that to occur in mid-August. And we anticipate publication mid to late August. So what do we also have? We also have an LOA certification test. Um, this is version specific. There's no annual refresher and you only need an update if there's a new version out. Uh, the test is 30 minutes, 30 questions, and you need an 80%, which is 24 questions correct to pass, and you get a certificate and email widget. Uh, and then again, what we've done is the certification is valid forever unless there's a new change, so unless there's a new version. So anyone in version two can take an updated test, and the test will just be for version three updates. Uh, we've got a reduced fee. It's not set yet, but that's kind of where we're at with the LOA, and I'm going to turn it back over to Gene, but that's the LOA specification and and where we're at with it. Thank you, Kevin. Looks very good. A lot of hard work. Okay, so I think at this point we're going to move on to poll question number two. If you are not certified in the USIBD LOA, would you be interested in finding out where and when you can become certified. Again, I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds and then we'll show the results for a bit and then move on. Okay, Sean. Moving on. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce, introduce Amir Rubin, founder of Paracosm. We're going to change presenters. And you should have it, Amir. Great. 
Well, thanks a lot, Gene. All right, you know, I'm, I'm uh, really glad uh, and thank everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, my name is Amir Rubin. I'm the president of Paracosm, and our uh, mission is to uh, enable fast handheld and large scale 3D mapping. And I kind of want to start today with a, um, you know, a little fun overview of the history of our company, which we started in 2013 with the dream of 3Difying the world. And our big idea for how we wanted to do this was to develop a handheld 3D mapping system that everyone would be able to have to do collaborative mapping. And through our early work, we actually got connected with um, the Google Project Tango team out in Mountain View. And you know, if everyone, if anyone here remembers the Tango, it was a very ambitious smartphone project that was um, gonna add a uh, 3D mapping to um, to all all devices. And we were really excited to be one of the early development partners on it. And from our work with that, we then developed a low cost handheld system that was designed to scan people's houses. And you may ask, well. Why would you want to scan someone's house? We actually had a partnership with um, iRobot in mind. We were actually iRobot's first corporate investment because our big idea at the time was, hey, let's let's map everyone's house, and your Roomba can be a really smart vacuum cleaner once it has a full map of the room and it's not going to bump into things anymore. So our first two years of existence, we had, um, you know, I would say more whimsical consumer-oriented goals and. What happened was in um, about three years, you know, into you know 2015, two three years into our company, Paracosm's life, we started getting um, uh, engineers, contractors, and you know, uh, calling us out of the blue, asking if they could use our system to scan MEP spaces, to do basic building survey, to to monitor their construction sites, you know, especially on pre-construction and things like that, and so we kind of started to realize that perhaps what we were building had a much bigger application. So we asked ourselves, what would, you know, what would the perfect scanner for this use case look like? Because what was happening is everyone was buying our low cost scanner and it was not working in the you know, high, you know, industrial heavy duty environments of construction, engineering, and, and building survey. So we, in 2016, reimagined from the ground up what would a perfect building handheld, fast, easy scanner look like. And we spent a year in, in, in developing, experimenting. And in, in 2017, we um, announced the, the PX80 device, which uh, we were really lucky to be piloting with a lot of great partners on. It is um, a LiDAR and camera-based you know, professional surveying tool, and we finally began shipping to customers last year in 2018. And we've, ship, we've uh, since shipped to, I think, over 15 countries now. <laughs> and we have um, users all over the world and uh, using the PX80 for everything from construction monitoring to building documentation to forestry scanning, underground mining. So we're really excited to see all the different ways people have been uh, using the, the PX80. So that's sort of our brief company history, but I'm gonna dive in now a little more into the specifics about uh, the handheld uh, SLAM scanning and what it actually means. So zooming in here on the PX80, you can see fundamentally it's a device with three sensors. There's a camera, a Velodyne LiDAR. G mentioned earlier, LiDARs are starting to pop up on cars. We actually use the Velodyne VLP16 LiDAR, which is designed to be used on self-driving cars. We use an IMU, which is basically an accelerometer, gyroscope. And what the device does is it is able to take data from all of these sensors, and there's an onboard computer that fuses the LiDAR data, which is uh, collecting 300,000 uh, LiDAR measurements per second. 
So it's 300,000 3D distance measurements. The camera, which is collecting you know, color images that we're all familiar with, and the you know, accelerometer data, we combine all that data on board and the onboard compute on the PX80 runs a type of software uh, algorithm called SLAM. And what SLAM is doing is it's really calculating your walking path as you are holding the PX80 and walking through a job site or a building. And you can almost think of it as each position, each step on your walking path almost acts as a virtual tripod that we use to position the 3D LiDAR points. And that's how SLAM is working under the hood. And I'm going to show some animations of this in a minute. But the way to think about SLAM and accuracy is a little more complex than with a uh, tripod, pure tripod based system, because already you know already you can you could say what 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 determines the slam accuracy well the first step of the equation is how well does the sensor pick up the environment how well does the lidar and camera see the environment is the lighting good is the surfaces the lidar seeing uh locked on too well by the lidar is the slam software system that is you know one of paracosm's uh products is our, and one of our big efforts is we develop our own SLAM software. How well did our software combine all this data to calculate your walking path? And that is a big part of the accuracy consideration. Then there's also a question of what's called drift, where no matter how good a SLAM system is, the longer you walk, you kind of accumulate small errors from the computation error, from sensor noise, from all the uncertainty that Gene was talking about earlier. And as these little errors accumulate along your walking path, especially when you walk down hallways and new areas of a building, they kind of accumulate and result in an error called drift. And so tracking and drift are sources of global accuracy error in the SLAM system. And then there's also this concept, similar to what Kevin was discussing about, uh, you know, a level of accuracy, you know, and, and description where the actual surface quality of the LiDAR because we're using, you know, LiDAR is meant for self-driving car applications. They're a little noisier than normal. And so the question is how, you know, we, we how much surface details you really need for your application? Because um, in many cases, it's definitely worth the trade-off to be able to have a really fast, efficient scan. And so without further ado, let's let's look at some examples. So this animation here is, as the operator of the PX80, what you see on your screen. And you see this green line evolving. That is the operator, the PX80 scanner, walking through this office environment. And you can see as they walk, their walking path weaves its way through the office. And as you enter a new hallway area, you see we calculate your walking path and the LiDAR's new LiDAR points start to fill in the details. And so this is the exact illustration of what I was talking about before. The sensors are being used to calculate your walking path, and then the LiDAR data is um, glued into place with along your walking path, and you end up with uh, the scan of your office. And what's really nice about this is as you're scanning, you can see what you're doing, and you get a good real-time preview. And we actually had a really great question before the start of the webinar about are there any standard operating procedures to guarantee accuracy? And you know, we'll we'll start to address that a little bit um, even on this slide here, which is a screenshot of this uh, real-time preview you saw of a scan. Now, what you'll immediately notice when you look at this real-time preview is the start of the scan is in a nice on the the um, left hand of the screen, to start a scan, everything looks really nice and square and plumb. I'm in a big open area when I started to walk. By the end of my scan, which you see on the right hand of the screen, I've walked all over this office building. So my walking path has accumulated errors, especially in the corridor area, which you see labeled. And you could kind of see how the errors in the software have caused doubling and some errors in the calculation. And you could see it's a, it looks sloppy and you can see there's 
the system is confused, there's doubling of walls. And so one of the ways that SLAM systems uh, have, one of the methods that we work with our customers on is uh, to get what's called a uh, loop closure to eliminate the drift errors. So one way to do that is we, you can start and end the scan in the same area, start and end. And the software can optionally use this to uh, snap the scan together like a puzzle piece and clean up the drift. And I'll show the end result in just a minute. But I just want to take a moment to, to talk about this idea. And it's really similar to what Kevin said is uh, about having to talk with uh, clients and customers. We spend a lot of time talking with our PX80 users to ask them about their environments that they like to scan in because some are scanning forests, some are scanning buildings with many small rooms, some scan construction sites. And in every environment, we wanna work to develop a standard operating procedure with our customers so that they are getting good loops, they're getting good scan technique for their specific use case environment because the way that you can guarantee accuracy in a SLAM system is by having these uh, procedures for how to scan and how to capture loops. And again, a loop just means during your scan, you're revisiting an area you visited before. And we always like to say there's inner loops, there's outer loops. An outer loop would just mean starting and stopping in the same area. Inner loop is if you're in a segment of a building, you may want to have a smaller inner loop. And you know, again, these are optional. These, it, it, this all depends on the uh, customer needs and the use case and the environment because there's certain environments where drift is not an issue and there's certain environments where it is. And there's also certain environments where ground control points could be used in lieu of loop closure if you want to, for example, go down a straight long mine shaft, perhaps ground control at each end of a subway tunnel or a shaft might be a better solution. There's another element to consider as well, as you saw in the animation in the preview, the LIDARs that we use are measuring, there's 300,000 points per second, and the LIDAR uncertainty is a plus or minus three centimeter sphere, as Gene said. It's, it's a pretty big, when you account for both plus or minus, that's, that's almost two to three inches of uh, uncertainty on every single measurement from the LIDAR. So a very important part of the uh, processing software that we've had to develop is when the LIDAR gets a repeated point on the same surface, it's like there's a lot of redundancy. We're, we're getting 300,000 points per second where a lot of those points are overlapping on like the same object. We effectively like average these points together to almost noise filter them. And by averaging all of these redundant points, in practice, we actually do get the uncertainty down to a very reasonable level, usually up to plus or minus one centimeter. So again, the whole you know, discussion around accuracy is always dependent on what the user and customer need, because there's considerations for what we call the global accuracy that's addressed by loop closure, and there's considerations for surface accuracy, which is how fine of detail is a given surface. And these are affected by scan technique, the sensor itself, and for many applications, the advantages of being able to really quickly capture with a SLAM system uh, more than makes up for the, you know, the like the lower uh, surface resolution or a little bit of drift. Just as in the LOA standard, there's an LOA standard for five centimeter. Many times that's absolutely great. Um, and so going to the case study of our office here, you could just see there's, you know, yours truly scanning in the, op in the on the left in the open office environment. Open environments tend to scan really well with low drift. On the right, you could see entering a hallway or corridor is a new area that the sensors have not seen before. These are the areas that tend to need these uh, standard operating procedures and uh, loop closures to really lock in your accuracy. And so now what you see is a nice screenshot from our viewer software that shows 
uh, a mini map of a nice clean office scan and the photospheres that we capture along the way. So what's really nice is after we're done post-processing the data, we end up with a really nice map, a really nice point cloud of the environment and photosphere. And you can see this is a cutaway view of the point cloud in color. We're able to use the color from our camera to colorize the LiDAR points. And you can see when we kind of chop away the floor and the ceiling, we are able to very clearly see the building structure, which many of our customers use to for their BIM modeling. They import this into their CAD and BIM model tool of choice, and they, you know, they generate the BIM model. And again, it's always a question: Do you represent the walls as flat? Do you represent them in their, you know, if they're plumb or out of um, out of truth? And there's also questions of is is the actual, how do we know what the accuracy of the actual uh, scan is, especially in a SLAM system? So we'll keep exploring these questions as we go. But I just wanted to show some more views of the office, you know, here without the color, you can see uh, we pick up a lot of detail. And again, this is a 5,000 square foot office and it's about a 90 second walking path through the office that captures this entire scene where we're able to walk into individual rooms, you can see we capture individual rooms, all the pillars, furniture, desks, and what's really nice is not only are we capturing all this detail in a one minute walking time through the office, but everyone was on their lunch break and having lunch. No one has to uh, leave or shut down the space during scan time. So you can be scanning in a live construction site, you could be scanning in an active retail, office, hospital, airport environment, and the scanner just happily works as usual. And you can see full color, we see everyone having their break room lunch in the 3D scan. And also you can see clearly the wall structures, the inner outer walls, the columns, the pillars. You can even see the coffee mugs on the wall. And what's really powerful is all this details captured with a very quick walkthrough. We sometimes, for customers who would like to do industrial settings, again, it's all about working to understand customers' needs, we can more aggressively uh, filter the data by averaging more points and we can work with the customer to have standard procedures for scanning that they create more overlap when they scan an, a facility and that way we can more aggressively filter and average all of the LiDAR points to even further smooth out and reduce noise for industrial facilities where we want to see pipes. And here you can see we have nice views of all these pipes. Now, there is a limit to how fine of a resolution. You know, we, we, we don't pick up very fine pipes, but for the most part, it's still a very effective tool that can even document industrial elements and pipe structures. So, um, you know, what we really, are always about is the dream of how can we effectively 3D map, 3D capture huger and huger areas. And so we recently did a, one of our customers actually uh, scanned a 74,000 square foot um, community college building and they shared some of the results with us. And this is a single story, 74,000 square feet. And the, challenge of this space was that there are many, many classrooms and study nooks and places for students to hang out. So it's not just that 74,000 square feet is massive, it's that there are, it's a very complex space to scan. And so the entire floor was scanned in four and a half hours by walking the floor, walking through every classroom, you know, and the scan's broken up multiple times. But after the scanning is done, the PX80 post processes the data, the customer aligns the individual scans together and eventually we're actually going to be automatically aligning the scans and then the scan can then be used in your preferred CAD or BIM tool to create models and we always tell people if you have questions about how to model a point cloud you know please contact us because we, we can help get you started if you even have questions about that and so with the we even have users who um, will by multiple PX80s for scenarios where there's millions of square feet on multi-story buildings and they, ha they have a team of three people, each with their own handheld device, 
scanning independently and they merge the scans afterwards. So it's really exciting to see how people are using the PX80 to capture massive areas. So this is the 74,000 square feet in question of this community college. And you can see this is the, the top down view, the point cloud, and it's just a massively complex space that only required four hours, four and a half hours of scanning capture time in field. And um, you can see when we cut away of the ceiling, you can see all the details in the classrooms. And just visually, you, could, you can get a feel for the level of, of detail in, in the scan. You can capture both the, you know, the office space, the hallways, we can capture exteriors of buildings. What's really powerful with these tools is they work interior and exterior. And the, the final question is again, you know, we're always asking how, you know, what new use cases did this enable? And uh, I'll, I'll finish up, I think we're running out of time. And so, you know, we, we have customers who are now using this to scan construction sites on a uh, weekly basis to monitor progress. And, in all these cases, the question of accuracy comes up where we ask, how do I know the accuracy of my scan when I'm done? This was a slam-based system. I followed the standard operating procedure. How do we know? And we, we internally measure ground truth several different ways. We have case studies, which we'll share with all the attendees after the fact, where we take a PX80 scan and have a reference laser disto measurements, kind of like Kevin's you know, double check method. We have uh, work in progress where we're comparing ground control survey to PX80 scans to kind of get that global accuracy that is a measurement done with a SLAM system correspond with a secondary uh, methodology, a secondary modality scan. And the local surface actually, how local, how accurate do we need our surfaces to be? And again, that, that always depends on the application. We always tell people, you know, talk to us first. And so, you know, Please look forward in your email uh, to you know some case studies about uh, slam scanning and uh, you know how to think about accuracy in these scenarios. Thank you, Amir. Very good. Uh, just switch your back to me. <clears throat> Where is um, um, how do um, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, so we uh, are just about out of time, but uh, let's get the key takeaways in. Uh, every professional surveying project must start with a clear statement of the intent and the required level of accuracy. These will determine the methods and equipment to be used. The intent and the LOA are all too often not clearly defined and understood by owners. As you have heard, the problem of specifying the 3D positional uncertainty of a laser scanning survey is a complicated one. But if we don't invest in working on it, we will all continue to reinvent the wheel. The USIBD and ASTM E57 are steps in the right direction. The industry needs to support their efforts to develop the needed standards and improve productivity. This includes the vendors and the customers. As Amir Rubin has shown, an entrepreneur with a vision and the desire to succeed can make great things happen. On a final note, please help us by joining the Younger Geospatial Professionals Group on LinkedIn, regardless of your age. The future of our industry depends on it. I wanna thank Amir and Kevin. Before we begin the Q&A, we'll have time for maybe one or two. We'd like to thank everyone for attending this LIDAR News educational webinar. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact us via the email addresses here. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So please submit your questions. Uh, we will get all of these answered. We're basically out of time, but um, Sean, do you have one or two that we might take a shot at? Yeah, um, I don't know. I know, Amir, you mentioned talking about the best practices or standard operating procedures for ensuring accuracy. Uh, is, is there anything you recommend beyond uh, 
beyond loop closure, for instance, you know, uh, checking the environment for specific sort of factors like light, darkness, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, ensuring always, the cloud is accurate and doesn't show too much drift or other error, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's related to how does it, there's a question even how well does it work, light and dark. So the, the, the system tends to work well in either well lit or dark environments. It doesn't like big changes between them. Planning your walking path ahead of time gives a lot of good mental focus when you're walking to ensure you're getting a good path and avoiding scenarios in the environment that trick the sensors, like really narrow passageways. We have methods to walk through doors and down narrow hallways that we, you know, train people on so that it doesn't confuse the, the sensors when it, they're, it's entering a new area in a narrow passageway. Sounds good. Um, I think it's a little bit after three. I would like to respect everyone's uh, schedule here. So I think we should wrap it up. Uh, we will get all the questions answered. Uh, on behalf of Paracosm, the USIBD and LIDAR News, we want to thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Please let us know what you think of the webinar by filling out the short survey. Thank you.